At some point, we have all looked with wonder into the night sky at the planets and the constellations. It's fun to look at the stars and discover what's out there. Astronomy can be a fun and exciting hobby, but it's also a very serious science, and it's come light years since its humble beginnings. I'm Donna Vesey, your adventurista. Thank your lucky stars, because this episode of Hitting the Road is out of this world. <laughs> I'm hitting the road again Got adventure crawling under my skin Going places that I've never been I'm hitting the road I'm hitting the road again Going to take along all my friends Living life like there's just no end I'm hitting the road Feeling better since I don't know when I'm hitting the road on this episode of Hitting the Road, we begin our star search with a physicist at Colorado College, as well as meet a man who actually built his own telescope. Then we'll make the trek to the Very Large Array in Socorro, New Mexico, where scientists actually listen in on the universe. To better understand astronomy and stargazing, we met with Dr. Shane Burns, professor of physics at Colorado College. Astronomy is really uh, the study of the cosmos outside of the Earth. Uh, I guess, you know, astronomy is one of the oldest sciences perhaps the oldest. Uh, mathematics and astronomy are two of the original liberal arts. Uh, uh, astronomy has been something that, that humans have been interested in from the very beginning. Modern astronomy is applying science to trying to understand why the cosmos is the way it is. Um, originally, astronomy was cataloging what's in the the sky uh, early on, everyone knew there were stars in the sky. There were these wandering stars, which came to be called planets. Nobody quite knew what they were at first. They thought they were much different than the Earth. The Earth was the center of the solar system. Um, it wasn't until Galileo, really, that, uh, that the scientific method was applied in kind of a modern form to the subject of astronomy. And he concluded, of course, that the sun is the center of the solar system. Got in a lot of trouble doing that, but he, he uh, concluded that was the case. And that was really the beginning of astronomy, modern astronomy, where the scientific method is applied to understanding the universe. So who first started astronomy and how did they use it? Uh, it's hard to say, um, but certainly there are records, Egyptian records, Babylonian records, that indicate that they were very interested in astronomy because they could use it to determine when to plant their crops, for example. And so originally it had very, very practical, uh, practical applications. Astronomy is important, I think, because we want to know our place in the universe. I mean, I could make the argument, and I think there's a good argument to be made, that astro astronomy allows us to understand something about the way the world works. And if we understand the way the world works, there are lots of applications. And most scientists, I think, are more motivated by understanding the way the world works than necessarily making a new widget or making some new technology. Of course, that new technology can, can, you know, cure cancer, perhaps. I mean, there are lots of wonderful things you can do with technology, but I think basic research fundamentally has its uh, motivation in, um, in, in trying to just understand how the world works. So why is the study of stars important? Uh, well, the study of stars is important, I suppose, because they're, they are laboratories of sort of exotic physics. Um, you can't produce the temperatures and pressures in the center of the star uh, here on Earth. And so a lot of what we know 
Well, at least some of what we know about nuclear physics comes because we understand how s stars work. So how did these stars form? They formed because of just the mutual gravitational attraction of the, the gas and dust. So if, say, there's a slightly denser region in the universe, perhaps because of this dark matter that's pulled in some of this gas, uh, that um, gas, as it uh, falls together under its mutual gravitational attraction, gains some kinetic energy. It starts to speed up as gravitational potential energy turns into kinetic energy, just like if I drop something, uh, it's, it speeds up from zero speed to some high speed when it hits the ground. In the same way, all of that gas collapses and speeds up, but those molecules begin to run into one another and that heats up the gas and finally the gas gets so hot and so dense by the gravitational attraction that it uh, begins to fuse into heavier elements. So the protons in, in a hydrogen atom run into one another and turn into helium atoms. Energy from, uh, from the nuclear fusion, it, it comes from Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. Uh, four hydrogen nuclei weigh less than one helium nuclei, and four hydrogen make nuclei make up a helium nucleus. And so that extra mass goes into energy, and that's the energy that powers the stars. What is the coolest thing you've ever seen that's excited you? Perhaps the experience that was the most startling happened over a long period of time, and it was when we discovered this accelerated expansion effect in the, in the universe. But it wasn't sort of a eureka moment, and I think that's a disservice that many movies give us, that suddenly a scientist has an epiphany and it's a big eureka moment. Well, no, I mean, this was a long process of doing some analysis and then finally sitting back and saying, well, this is saying there's accelerated expansion. Wow, what is that about? What causes that? You know, that's a question that I'm hoping is answered in my lifetime. Maybe it won't be, but that, that's probably the coolest experience I had in science. The most important characteristic of a scientist is a willingness to give up cherished beliefs. Today, it's easy and exciting to enter the world of astronomy, and in this age of information, one can build their own telescope. We visited Tom Patti, an amateur astronomer who actually built his own telescope using basic construction supplies. He even ground his own glass by hand. My father uh, brought home a telescope for Christmas for the three brothers uh, to learn together on. And from that point on, you were interested? Yeah, I got, you know, it was great for looking at the moon. And the moon, if you can see nothing else, the moon is a fascinating introduction into astronomy and things otherworldly. Pretty cool to see yeah. the moon. Yeah, there, there, there are hundreds of things to see on the moon and it changes every day. So you built your own telescope? I did. Um, uh, I, 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 like, as I said, I've been interested in astronomy since we were young. hale -Bopp, Comet hale -Bopp was mm -hmm. in the skies at the time. And, uh, and that got me to buy my first telescope uh, in my adult life. That was a pretty big telescope back then. Um, that led to more and more uh, curiosity and periodicals and reading some more and, and then just going out and looking at stars. I was lucky to be in San Francisco Bay Area at the time uh, where a fellow named John Dobson um, was teaching people how to make telescopes. <clears throat> uh, Newtonian re reflecting telescopes and uh, uh, that was the beginning of my decision to make my own telescope. What did you build it out of? My, my design has uh, wood, it has sono tubes which you use to pour concrete piers, um, uh, plywood, I have virgin teflon and then I have a 12 inch 
uh, hard disk platter, the magnetic platter from an old hard disk drive from probably the late 70s, early 80s. And that's all the tools that you need to build a telescope? Yeah, screws and nuts and glue and some varnish, <laughs> some glass. And you ground the glass yourself, is that right? It took about 30 hours to grind a 12 and a half inch mirror. And that was just the mirror that took the 30 hours? The primary mirror, yes. Okay. Um, so it's a 12 and a half inch diameter. It's uh, two and a half inches thick of Pyrex glass. Uh, I, you know, I probably weighs 25 or 30 pounds. Just the glass? Just the mirror. Yeah. Just the mirror. How long did it take to build the whole telescope? Uh, you know, it's so much fun. <laughs> I really didn't keep track of that. I, I built it over a course of a, several weeks. You know, the, the class that I took at the California Academy of Sciences, I think was about two months, maybe it's three months. There must be a sense of satisfaction building your own telescope like that. It is pretty neat. You know, there are so many variables that can go wrong. Um, you can be off in the figure of the mirror by one one thousandth the thickness of a piece of saran wrap and, and end up with a fuzzy mirror, uh, fuzzy imaging from the mirror. Um, so so there, there are parts of you going, I hope this comes out okay. Um, so can anybody build a telescope? Anybody can build a telescope. It was, it was fascinating. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, there are books out there, there are videos. It's, uh, it was amazing. Did you do this by yourself or did your kids work alongside you? No, I did it. I did this uh, one by myself. They were too young. Like they were uh, two and not born. <laughs> okay. What's the first thing you get when you want to build your telescope? The first task is grinding your mirror or purchasing a mirror. Um, grinding a mirror is a lot of work. Um, 10 hours on the short side for a six inch mirror uh, to as many as you want to spend on it. You, know, you, need the, you need to make the mirror cell, which supports the mirror and helps you um, collimate or align the mirror. You have to align the optical path so that the light that comes in from the, the front of the telescope bounces off the mirror straight into a secondary mirror and then bounces it outside of the tube so that then you can focus on it and look at it with your eye. So when you align that, that's called collimation. Um, so you need to build the cell for the mirror inside of a tube and then you'll need to make the spider vein which is where the secondary mirror that bounces the light outside of the optical tube is placed. Um, and you work on focuser, um, and then eyepiece and all together, it all, all works together. Why is astronomy important? I guess astronomy taught me uh, how to realign what was important in my life, uh, and how, how small I am, a small part of a very large universe, uh, and that my problems that seem so big are not so big. Uh, it's easy to get lost in looking at a in an open cluster of stars or in in a in a great big nebula. It's a cloud gas that's up there. Looks like a bat wing or you know, all kinds of really cool things up there that make you forget about your problems. What's the coolest thing about astronomy? I guess it would just be the journey, the exploration seeing something new that you haven't seen or seeing it differently than you've seen it before. Uh, it's just not something that you see in everyday life. You can go, you can just see anything you want to see. It's a time machine. You can look back at a galaxy <clears throat> that's 125 million light years away. And so it took that photon of light 125 million years to leave that star, which may not even exist anymore and now it just got absorbed into your eye. And that's pretty cool. The Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array Radio Astronomy Observatory is a radio telescope located on the plains of St. Augustine in west central New Mexico. It is part of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, a facility of the National Science Foundation. 
I took a tour of the Very Large Array with Dave Finley, Public Information Officer for the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Since we're out here in the middle of what seems like nowhere, why did they choose this spot to build the VLA? Well, they had several criteria that they were looking for. They wanted to be in the southern part of the United States because you can see more of the sky that way. Okay. They wanted a large flat area because we have railroad tracks running along here. We wanted to move antennas and we didn't want to be moving them up and down over hills. Uh, if you'll notice as you look around here, we're surrounded by mountains. Those shield us from radio interference from things on the ground. Okay. Uh, they also wanted a dry climate because for some of the frequencies where we observe, you don't want a whole lot of water vapor in the air. Uh, they wanted it remote from a major metropolitan area because that would cause radio interference. Uh, and yet they still wanted a decent highway and power and an ability to get some water out here. And they started out by looking at, uh, at topo maps for the southwest U.S. They didn't look at anything east of the Mississippi. West of the Mississippi and south of 35 degrees latitude. Uh, and they picked a, a number of places based on topo maps. And then they did aerial photos. And each time they were able to throw a few out. But then they started doing, let's go walk on the place. And this place came up really top from the beginning. There were three finalists, uh, two in New Mexico and one over in Arizona, and in 1972 they came up with the recommendation that this should be the place. I think one of the real keys to the success of the VLA has been how versatile it has been. Uh, that they designed a general purpose radio telescope and they got something that has contributed to almost every area of astronomy. I like to say that uh, if you get a up-to-date modern introductory textbook on astronomy, uh, you probably can't turn to a chapter that doesn't include some fact that was first discovered here at the VLA. Uh, we have had many thousands of observing projects, thousands of astronomers, uh, hundreds of refereed uh, scientific papers published every year. Uh, in fact, it's the most uh, scientifically productive ground-based telescope in the history of astronomy. Dr. Rick Perley is one of the scientists at the Very Large Array. Astronomy is the physics of the universe. So it's mankind's um, attempt to understand the processes of, of the evolution of the universe, the origin of the universe, the origin and evolution of the constituents of the universe, which would include the galaxies, the stars, the planets, uh, and of the whole universe itself. What's the difference between radio astronomy and optical astronomy? Well, it has to do with the wavelength. It, astronomy is broad, and you could categorize it as radio astronomy, optical astronomy, infrared astronomy, ultraviolet astronomy, there's all kinds of different kinds of astronomy. It's not possible for any one person to be an expert over all of the different kinds of instrumental and wavelength dependent uh, telescopes. Uh, we use a tremendous range of techniques that use, and, and it is incredibly complex. These telescopes are, comp are complicated. So they all need instrumental specialists to move forward. So tell me how it works for our viewers. How do you get the images? How does how does the radio um, uh, work? Sure. Tell us how that works and so start with a, the statement. A radio telescope is what we call a diffraction limited device. And what that means is, is that its resolution, the ability to separate small structure on the sky, you know, you, you can think of a galaxy in a galaxy. Right. Um, now suppose your galaxies are actually rather close together you'd like to be able to separate them, to resolve. This is what we mean by resolve, is to be able to separate as individuals objects that are close. Or, for a single galaxy, say, to separate out the constituents as separate stars, um, whatever parts that, that may make them up. So there's two factors which play into resolution. One is the diameter of the telescope, the other one is the frequency at which you're using it. If you are, want to build a telescope that, say, works at a frequency of 1400 megahertz, which is 21 centimeters in its wavelength, you need a very large telescope because this is a long wavelength 
therefore you need a big aperture. To put things in simple terms, the diameter of the moon is about 30 arc minutes of angle on the sky. A radio telescope of 25 meter aperture, which is your sort of ordinary telescope, and it's the size, the diameter of a telescope which constitu which makes up the VLA, it's one of the 27 telescopes, has a resolution at 21 centimeters of about the diameter of the moon. That's not very good. So we, we need a telescope, if we're going to get a one arc second resolution, we need a telescope that's 1,800 times bigger than 25 meters. Right. So that's a telescope about equal to the to the whole VLA. Okay. So the way the VLA and all interferometers work in the radio regime is that you take a bunch of little telescopes and you move them to the distance apart that you would like to have a big telescope and then you arrange for them to work together as if they were a big telescope. This is the technique of what's called aperture synthesis. So what are some of the things that you actually have seen? Well, the VLA was originally designed with this 35 kilometer baseline to get about this one arc second of resolution at a wavelength of 21 centimeters. And this was done with a couple of scientific goals in mind. Spiral galaxies are these beautiful grand design spirals that people should be familiar with uh, if they're interested in astronomy from say optical photographs, like Andromeda galaxy and many other galaxies that have got beautiful pictures. These things have much hydrogen in them, and they're also arranged in the spiral arms. And we needed to understand the relationship between the spiral arms as seen by optical light and those spiral arms that potentially are, are seen in, in, uh, uh, in the radiation of what we call H1, which is neutral hydrogen. So that was one of the things that was driving the VLA's design. Another one is quasars. Quasars were discovered in the 1960s. They are enigmatic, huge, um, amount of luminosity, power coming out of these distant galaxies with strange and exotic nuclear emission and large fluffy regions of, of, of relativistic particles. It didn't look anything like the optical emission from the galaxy in the middle. And so in order to understand these physical processes, we needed much higher resolution mm -hmm. so that we could resolve the features, which again needs much longer baselines. In this case, they're the people who designed the array were thinking of a wavelength of six centimeters, which gives us a resolution of about um, 400 milli arc seconds or 0.4 arc seconds. And that was felt to be about right for resolving the features in the radio emission from these enigmatic galaxies that were fueled, as it turns out, by black holes, that ejecting relativistic particles along thin lines, which we call jets, that somehow fill up these big cavities in interstellar intergalactic space uh, but um, to understand these processes we needed to resolve these processes and for that you need a very large array so these are the kinds of things that were driven that drove the design of the very large array what is the coolest thing that you've mm -hmm. ever discovered we had a project to look for radio jets so radio jets are these pathways which we believe conduct high energy beams or particles from black holes at the center of, of galaxies to inflate these large cavities filled with relativistic particles. Theory said, the theorists said, there has to be pathways which channel the energy, for which the energy is being channeled to power these large, incredibly luminous blobs of radiation. So I and uh, a fellow young astronomer had ap made an application to use some time to look at a radio galaxy called 3C449. So we're working late at night and computing in those days was painfully slow. And we were typing on our terminals and my compatriot says, go down to the line printer, I'm printing out our map. We had no idea what we were going to see. So I go down to the line printer and I can see the line, the paper coming out and there's just a big bar going down the page. And I, I, I shook my head and I went back to my, to my compatriot, my coworker, and I said, we've done something wrong. There's just a big <laughs> bar going down the page. And he says excitedly, no, no, that's what we want to find. <laughs> and it turned out the big bar were these big jets. So 
that was that was really cool. Wow. And that was done without any magic of self-calibration or any of these fancy computing techniques. So you feel that astronomy is important so that we know our place in the universe and understand our place in the Astronomy universe. is important because it is, it, it is an, a constituent of our place in the universe. It is part of where we are and to understand where, we're, where it is going and you might say where we are going and then by turning it around where it came from and how we got here, that is part of the natural human curiosity, the quest of our life. The Orion Nebula that you're looking at here is um, 1,600 light years away, and it's 26 light years across side to side. That's amazing. Science is cool. How can you not love it? I'm hitting the road again. Got adventure crawling under my skin. Going places that I've never been. I'm hitting the road. Don't know.